Hey guys, this looks like a fun one. It's a clock with a bunch of different mathematical expressions. I'm thinking let's go through all of them. If you want to try it on your own, pause it right now because I'm going to go through them in three, two, one. First, we have sine of pi over two. One thing you could do is graph y equals sine of x and then find pi over two and see that the height of this is one. So sine of pi over two is equal to one. But if this feels like cheating, we can do it a different way. We can look at this unit circle instead. Let's draw this right triangle and let's label this angle theta. And then the side opposite the theta we'll call opposite and the longest side we'll call hypotenuse. The sine of this angle is defined as opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of pi over two is equal to opposite over hypotenuse where pi over two is this central angle theta. And we can see the pi over two radians is right here. It's the same thing as 90 degrees. So let's move this triangle so the theta is equal to 90 degrees. At 90 degrees, it forms a triangle that is just a segment. Here it is right before that, and then boom, it smashes. It's kind of weird to think about, but what's happening is there are two 90 degree angles, which makes this last angle zero degrees. We can see in this weird triangle, the opposite is the same length as the hypotenuse. So the ratio of opposite over hypotenuse will be equal to one. So the sine of pi over two is equal to one. And that's why this represents one o'clock. We just looked at two different ways you can find it. There are lots of different ways using trigonometry. I think we should move on to the next hour. This says d over dx of two x. Now you might be tempted to just cancel the d's and cancel the x's and then you'll have two. But it doesn't really work that way. So that's just a coincidence. What this is saying is find the derivative of two x. So that means if we graph the line y equals 2x, it wants to know what is the slope of this line. And we can see that the rise over run, the slope of this line is equal to 2. So the derivative of 2x is equal to 2. Next, let's go into the determinant of this matrix. Here are the notes for the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix. If you have a matrix A, B, C, D, you would do A times D minus B times C. So it's this times this minus this times this. So we can do the same thing for our determinant. It'll be five times two minus one times seven. And this simplifies to 10 minus seven, which is equal to three. So this determinant is equal to three. And that's why this is in the three o'clock slot. Now let's look at the four o'clock slot. This is a giant pi, and it means we're gonna end up taking a product. So first let's look at the n equals one and the three. That means we start at n equals one, and then we go to n equals two, and then we go to n equals three, and we stop at n equals three because of the three on top here. If this had been a five on top, we'd go all the way to n equals five. And then since this is a pi, that means we're gonna end up doing a product. We're gonna end up multiplying these things. And this n plus one over n, that tells us what we multiply each time. For the first one, we're going to change all the ends into one. For this one, we're going to change all the ends into two. And for this one, we're going to change all the ends into three. So this represents this product. And now we can simplify it. One plus one is equal to two, so we have two over one. Two plus one is equal to three, so we have three over two. And three plus one is four, so we have four over three. And there are a couple different ways to multiply this. I think it's going to be easiest if we cancel stuff out. This two on top and this two on bottom can cancel each other out. And this three on top and this three on bottom can cancel each other out. So in the end, we have four over one, which is equal to four. So this whole product is equal to four. And that's why this is in the four o'clock slot. And now let's look at this one. It's the square root of the square root of seven squared plus 24 squared. Seven squared is equal to 49. And we're gonna add to that 24 squared, which is 576. And then 49 plus 576 is 625. So now we have the square root of the square root of 625. So first let's deal with this square root of 625. It's equal to 25. And we still have this square root on the outside. And then the square root of 25 is equal to five. So this whole thing is equal to five. And that's why it's in the five o'clock slot. Now let's look at the six o'clock slot. This exclamation mark means factorial. This is three factorial. That means we're gonna do three times two times one, and we stop at one. That's what this symbol means. For example, if it had been seven factorial, it would have been seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. But since we're just three factorial, it's three times two times one. And then three times two times one is equal to six. So this is equal to six, and that's why it's in the six o'clock slot. Now let's do the next one. This is one fourth times, and then what is this funny symbol? This is called a combination. It's asking how many different ways can we select two objects from eight objects if the order doesn't matter. 
And here are the notes right here. This is the way we can find that out. You do n factorial over r factorial times the quantity n minus r factorial. And these factorials mean the same thing as they did right here for the three factorial. So now to evaluate eight choose two, we're gonna plug in eight factorial over two factorial times the quantity eight minus two factorial. And then once we figure this out, we're gonna have to multiply it by one fourth. So first let's deal with the two factorial. Two factorial means two times one, so that's just two. Let's make this two times this. And next let's do inside the parentheses. Eight minus two is equal to six, so this is six factorial. And then on top for the eight factorial, this means the same thing as eight times seven factorial. And then we can do that one more time to give us eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. The only reason I'm not showing the five, four, three, two, one here and the five, four, three, two, one down here is because it's easier just to cancel out these two six factorials. And that leaves us with eight times seven over two. Eight times seven is equal to 56 and 56 divided by two is 28. So now we're ready to do the one fourth times eight choose two. In the place of the eight choose two, let's plug in 28 and one fourth times 28 is equal to seven. So this whole thing is equal to seven. And that's why it's here at seven o'clock. Now we can go to this one. Two times two squared. I'm guessing they ran out of ideas. Two squared is equal to four and two times four is equal to eight. So this is equal to eight. Now we can go on to this one. This is the integral from zero to three of x squared dx. Ultimately, what it means is if we graph y equals x squared, where the x squared comes from this right here, it wants to know what is the area between this and the x-axis between x equals zero and three. And here's the zero and three here. This is asking for this area. I'm not familiar with the geometric way to find this, so let's switch to these notes. This is the integral power rule, power rule, power rule for integrals. It says if you have an integral from a to b of x n dx, the way you evaluate it is you add one to the exponent and then you divide by that new exponent. And then you evaluate it from b to a. And I'll show you what this means in a second. So to do this integral, it's gonna be x to the two plus one, and then we're gonna divide by two plus one, and we're gonna evaluate it from three to zero. And the exponent, this two plus one is equal to three, and this two plus one is equal to three. So now we have x cubed over three evaluated from three to zero. And now I can show you what this means. We're gonna do x cubed over three minus x cubed over three, but for the first x cubed over three, we're gonna plug in this three for the x. And then for the second x cubed over three, we're gonna plug in the zero. So that's where the three and zero come in right here. We plug in three here and zero here. And now let's simplify this. Three cubed is equal to 27, and that's still over three. And then zero cubed is equal to zero, so there's nothing there. And 27 divided by three is equal to nine. So this whole integral is equal to nine. And that's why it's located right here. And going back to this graph from earlier, this region under the parabola has an area of nine square units. How exciting. I was so excited I just said that. Now let's go on to this one. This is a summation. It's similar to this one here, except instead of multiplying, we're gonna be adding each of the terms. So once again, we have an n equals one, then n equals two, n equals three, and we're gonna stop at n equals four. And the thing that we're gonna be adding is n to each of these. So we end up with n plus n plus n plus n for these different values of n. So for the first one, it's n equals one, and then we're gonna add n equals two, and n equals three, and n equals four. And one plus two plus three plus four is equal to 10. So this whole thing is equal to 10, and that's why it's in the 10 o'clock spot. Now what's going on with this one? This is the cardinality of the union of sets. So first let's look at all the individual sets from zero to 10. So it's each of these sets. And then the union of all these sets is all of them coming together into a single set. So the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 are all in the same set. Now what these absolute value things mean is the cardinality. It wants to know how many of these are inside of the set. And there are 11 of them inside of here, so the cardinality is equal to 11. So this is equal to 11, and that's why it's in this spot. Now we're on to the last one. I've heard these called complex fractions, which is kind of funny because they're not actually a complex number. There might be other names for them. I had to look it up. They're also known as compound fractions, nested fractions, or double fractions. But whatever you call it, it ultimately means this fraction divided by this fraction. So let's write it that way. This fraction divided by this fraction. Now when you're dividing fractions, that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal of the second one. I learned this as keep 
change flip, where you keep the first fraction, change the divide into a multiply, and then flip the second fraction. So now we have 30 over 5 times 38 over 19. Each of these fractions can be simplified. 30 over 5 simplifies to 6, and then we can multiply that by 38 over 19, which simplifies to 2. And 6 times 2 is equal to 12. So this compound nested double fraction is equal to 12. That's why this is in the 12 o'clock spot. How exciting.